Hello and welcome to the program. Uh, today we have Ms. Eva Constantaris, a data journalist for Internews. Welcome to the show, Eva. Um, so I have a few questions for you about open source. Can you please just tell us uh, a little bit more about yourself? Well, I'm a data journalist with Internews Network, and basically what I do is I work with journalists and NGOs and academics to tell better stories with data. Um, on Monday, you had a workshop for open source for social innovation at the British Council. Um, it was a training workshop, so I was just wondering, what, uh, where else have you implemented your training around the world? Uh, we actually work in almost all um, continents around the world. So recently, I've run a workshop in Palestine focused on how economic data can improve uh, understanding of employment issues and GDP. Um, right before the elections in Afghanistan, we looked at how we could improve coverage of development issue. Um, development issues is really an important component of election coverage. And we've also worked in places like Kenya, uh, focused on health, where healthcare, especially for vulnerable groups, um, is a serious concern. So how can we look at health data to address the health concerns of, of vulnerable Kenyans? Can you give us examples about uh, what kind of sources are available to people? There's a lot of different data sources available when you start to look. Um, and I'll give you an example from Kenya, where we were covering um, the shortage of doctors in Kenya. So. Uh, we looked at the World Health Organization, which gave us recommendations for how many doctors you need for per 10,000 people. Um, so we used that number to extrapolate how many doctors Kenya needs. Um, and then we went to universities and asked them how many doctors were they able to train um, each year and how much does it cost to train doctors. Um, so basically what we found, crossing a couple of different data sets, was that if Kenyan universities were turning out as many doctors as they possibly could, it would take 21 years um, to meet the World Health Organization recommendations for um, doctors per capita. Um, so that basically changed the conversation from how do we provide universal health care to what's the best way to use the resources we have and the doctors we have um, to serve the people who really need um, vital health care services. Uh what social issues do you uh, mainly focus on, having open source available to everyone? The social issue really is driven by the local context. Um, so maybe in a place like Palestine, where unemployment is a huge issue, um, especially for young people, we focused a lot on, OK, can we look at what sectors are growing, what economic sectors are growing, and whether there's enough training for young people to fill the jobs in those sectors. So as things move away from an agricultural society to a more industrialized society, are there resources for people whose parents were in the agricultural sector to get training to work in industry? Um, so that's an example in Palestine. But again, um, in other countries, environmental issues are much, much more pressing, uh, such as in China, where pollution is a very big concern. So journalists wanted to be able to report better on pollution. Environmental NGOs really wanted to get the message out there about the steps necessary to prevent uh, more pollution and environmental disasters. Uh, so there was actually much more focused on data collected by the government um, and by other countries about trends in pollution rates and the effectiveness of different programs to combat the pollution issue. Um, so again, it really is driven by citizens' concerns and the social issues that they're prioritizing. Um, and then we look for open data um, to inform their decisions based on um, data to, to solve those social issues. Uh, what thoughts do you have on uh, current social issues happening on uh, the world? Um, I think social issues uh, also often can become very polemic. So people will debate um, the pros and cons of something, an issue like maternal health care. Mm -hmm. um, but then, for example, I was working with Sri Lankan journalists um, looking at HIV rates in Sri Lanka. And they looked at, okay, instead of just talking about it as a general issue, can we identify who are the most vulnerable groups? Um, so what segments of society need to be protected? Um, where are rates of HIV highest? And can we look at the rate per capita, the total number of people suffering from HIV in a specific district? And then also look at funding to treat HIV. So does HIV spending match up with the number of cases in that district? How much are they spending per person, per district? 
and then identify the districts where really there isn't enough funding to treat all the people with HIV and to have outreach programs and prevention programs. So you can turn something that would otherwise be sort of a general debate um, without any specific solutions to something, something solvable, something that we can address this by going to the district with the least funding, um, encouraging them to develop more targeted programs to reach vulnerable groups and dedicate more resources uh, to that specific area and those specific groups. Uh, considering open source is available to everybody, what should people be mostly aware of? I think what people need to be aware of is that there is more open data and open source software um, available every day. So there are technologists out there that are building tools. Um, there's free tools to get data off the web. Um, there's free tools to create simple visualizations. So software like Data Wrapper. It's a free software on the web um, where someone can go and paste in a data set. So if you have 10 years of data on dengue fever rates, in Colombo. You can paste in, so in 1990 there were this many cases, 1991 there were this many cases, for as long as you have data for, and it will create a simple timeline for you where you can give people the context about how bad is the disease. You know, it might be on the front page news every day that there is another case of dengue, but do people understand how much dengue there is today versus 10 years ago or 20 years ago? Um, and again, so there's free software to get that data off the web, there's free software to visualize it, and then there's, a free, there's free software to broadcast your message. Um, so it just makes information and data a lot more accessible to ordinary citizens. Um, what are some proven methods that uh, people could use to collect data through open source? Um, that's actually an exciting area um, right now because data collection has been something that's been questionable in a lot of contexts. So data is collected, but it's difficult to verify how many people did they survey to get this data. Um, did they go to every district, or did they just ask people in one area? Um, so there's software like the Open Data Toolkit that enables NGOs and governments and citizens to actually go out and collect their own data. So it's often a app on a simple phone or a smartphone that they can go out and conduct sim simple interviews. So even something like, do you have a job? And you can send in yes or no, and it will automatically aggregate that information for you um, online um, so you can present your own findings um, using your own data that you personally collected. Uh, apart from the World Wide Web, um, what other sources can people collect open source data from? Well, actually, most data is often still available in undigitalized formats in universities, in government offices, in NGOs. So it's still a lot of boots on the ground. You still have to go to get their print records, to get the budgets, to get you know PDF or print reports um, that contain that data. And I always suggest, even if you do find data online, still talk to the original source. Find out who produced that data and get to understand the data better. So go back to if it's Ministry of Health data. So if you've got rates of dengue fever, go back to the Ministry of Health and ask them, so how was this data collected? How many people did you ask? Did you get the data from hospitals? Or did you get the data by serving citizens directly? Um, and the more you actually have contact with the people collecting the data, the better you will be able to report and tell a story based on that data. Um. Considering on the workshop that you did uh, on Monday at the British Council, what views can you express regarding social issues that are currently happening maybe in Sri Lanka or Palestine or China? Um, I think social issues that I see coming up again and again are things like unemployment and education and economy, which really are all very interrelated issues. It's basically a concern that young people aren't receiving the training necessary for, for the future, for the globalized future. So what is the globe is, around the world, we're still trying to understand what does a globalized economy look like and how do citizens from each country fit into that picture and how will they contribute to the growth of the, the local economy. Um, so again, it's making education accessible and we'll look at data to see, let's look at test scores and see what are the best schools offering different types of training programs. Um, we'll look at how many unemployed youth there are. So those education programs, how many people do they need to serve? Is there enough funding to serve all of those people? Or can they only train one in five people in, let's say, IT, if IT is, is a growing sector? 
Um, so really helping policymakers make informed decisions if, if they are going to invest in education to reduce unemployment. Do they understand over the next 10 years what economic sectors are, are going to be growing? So you need to look at the economic data to see what sectors are growing. You need to look at the current educational resources available and how many trained employees, their potential employees they're turning out. And you also need to look at the market and see what are hiring practices. Are they hiring locals? Are they outsourcing the, those jobs? Um, and can we create a smart policy um, proposal um, to really ensure that our next generation has the training and the skills um, to meet the jobs that will be available when they become um, employable. When it comes to Sri Lanka, uh, maybe open source isn't really you know, popular. So how can in Sri Lanka open a open source community? Well, Sri Lanka has a lot of uh, the ingredients needed for an open source community. First of all, the government of Sri Lanka has an open data portal. Right now, I believe it has about 89 data sets about the economy, um, about health. Um, it has a lot of very, about population. There's a lot of varied data sources. So already there's a lot of data out there. Um, you also have a very active research community. So there's scientists producing data about technology that could combat dengue fever by killing male mosquitoes. Um, you also have software engineers. You have software engineers who actually want to engage in social innovation and want to help solve problems in their society. So while their day job might be in a software company or in a corporation, they're also willing to contribute their time um, to projects to promote social good. Um, and you also have media. You have journalists that are interested in telling stories about cases where data has really improved the quality of life of people. Um, and explain to citizens why data is important um, and why these social issues are affecting um, the community and their daily lives. Uh, so you do have all of those elements present in Sri Lanka and like in many places it's just a question of well now how do we bring these people together. Um, so again that has taken place in different countries in different ways. Um, there's an organization called the Open Knowledge Foundation and their commitment is to open source, to open data, and to creating a global community um, around knowledge. Um, so that is one possibility for Sri Lanka, is to open a local branch of the Open Knowledge Foundation or School of Data as a meeting place. Um, and Sri Lanka has several tech spaces and libraries where already there is a convening place for communities like this. So it's, it's just a question of bringing people together around a common issue. And yesterday we, had a, we ran a test in which we had a data expedition, which is around a topic. So in this case, it was around infectious diseases. And we brought together journalists and software engineers and graphic designers to tell stories about infectious disease. And what they produced was a map of dengue incidents, timelines showing the growth, and the budgets for treating dengue. Um, and another group looked at the HIV issue. So how many people are infected with HIV per district, what are the vulnerable and at-risk groups, and does spending match um, with disease burden. And again, this was data that was out there. They just brought it together and then told a concise story through visualization and narrative uh, to explain those topics. And when you have all those skill sets, when you have a software engineer who can build a map, and you have a graphic designer who can design an infographic, and a journalist who can tell the story, you can create a more powerful narrative about a data issue than you would be able to just within a media outlet or within a corporation where all the skill sets are the same. So it's really bring, about bringing together those diverse skill sets um, around a common goal. And I think in Sri Lanka there's definitely the passion um, to bring all those groups together around social issues. It's just a matter of finding the appropriate convening space. Um, come back to open source. What benefits can come from this? Well, open source really democratizes data and democratizes technology. So a reason we're talking about open data right now is because a lot of the tools that five years ago might have been very expensive are now open source and free. So you can pull data off websites with a free Firefox or Google um, add-on extension. Um, so that'll let you download the data. And then a software like Data Wrapper or Tableau Public 
enables you to create visualizations um, based on that data. Um, free spreadsheet software, instead of having to buy a special software analysis product, there are free spreadsheet softwares that will let you sort data, analyze data, um, and identify trends. So things that projects that otherwise might have cost a lot of money in terms of investment and software and talent now can basically be done for free because not only are they now free but they're also create they're also simplified. So these tools might have required a lot of specialized knowledge before but now they've been redesigned for greater usability so even an ordinary person can make a simple map documenting dengue cases in Colombo or documenting cases of maternal death in Kenya or election violence in Afghanistan. So now ordinary citizens are more able to look at data themselves and um, come to conclusions and combined with the fact that more data gatherers from governments to universities to think tanks are putting their data online and making it available for free. So you don't need a subscription anymore to a business magazine to get economic data. They're putting that data up online for free so again the, the sources of information, the tools to analyze, and the tools to visualize and communicate your findings are all both free, easier to use, and more widely available. So as internet access increases in countries, more and more people are engaging with these tools, and they're finding ways to communicate their findings to audiences even in communities that don't have internet access. So while you might do most of your data mining online, you might find the data online and analyze it online, you might tell it through your findings through a radio program or a television broadcast. So there are still very traditional ways to communicate this information to communities and help people understand how a very complex nationwide issue affects their community. And that can be through telling the story. So you go out to the community and you find someone who had dengue fever. And you tell the story of, well, they, they didn't know the symptoms of dengue fever, so they waited longer than they should have before they went to the hospital. And then everyone who hears that story learns, okay, these are the symptoms of dengue. It's recommended that I immediately go to the hospital. So what is a big data issue can actually become very personalized and relevant to the community if you put a face to the story and you tell a powerful narrative of a citizen who was impacted by this issue. Um. I know that a lot of information on open source may be illegal or it might be false. How can users avoid this kind of information? I think with greater access to information, again, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, so I encourage that person-to-person -person contact. So if you find a tool or a data set um, that you're not sure about, you don't know where it came from, um, that is worth investigating. So I always suggest, no matter what the topic, if you're using tools to investigate a data set about, for example, uh, pollution rates, and you don't know if that pollution data is correct or not, so maybe it's a data set about contaminating groundwater, and you do your analysis and you show that there's a trend that groundwater contamination is going up, you want to talk to the local environmental authority and ask them whether your analysis is correct, whether the data is reliable. You want to talk to an environmental protection NGO and ask them the same questions. And this is, again, part of bringing together the community because using open source software and using open data is never something you really want to do on your own. You want to do it as a part of a community who is also, that is also concerned about the same issue. Um, so that really minimizes the risk of using something illegal or data that's of poor quality because you talk to people who know about the subject and who are knowledgeable and can help you inform, um, inform your decision about whether to use that data. And even if your data is bad, they probably know what software you can use, what database exists um, that will provide reliable information. And the more you form those relationships, the easier and faster it is to find quality data and know technical experts to talk to um, to find the best tools to do the analysis that you want. Um, how has open data evolved over the years? Open data is emerging very, very quickly. So around the world, um, there's a push for open government data. 
um, and that's part of open governance. Um, so a lot of governments, including the government of Sri Lanka, are, very, are getting very excited that there's all of a sudden citizen demand for data because lots of places collect data, they have reports that nobody ever reads, they have data sets nobody ever wants to look at. So for them, it can also be exciting that citizens want to engage in this data. So in a place like Kenya, where they launched an open data portal two years ago, um, now NGOs and universities are also putting their data up online uh, because they see that there is a demand. Uh, globally, the open data um, movement and open data uh, community is working together to do cross-border projects. Um, so people might be comparing what does GDP growth look like in India and Nepal and Sri Lanka and sort of trying to identify regional trends. And again, that helps you evaluate the quality of your data and it makes you part of a global open data movement um, that creates more tools, um, that encourages governments and NGOs to open more data um, and creates greater citizen demand for data-driven stories. Because maybe the first data-driven story a citizen reads about dengue in the closest hospital um, to them if they do suffer, if they catch dengue and for the first time they see a map online of where the closest hospital is to my house. And so that creates a demand for, they would like to read more stories. Okay, now I would like to read a story about what are the closest schools and how, how good are those schools? Um, what subject areas are they strong or weak in? So once citizens s sort of get a taste of that data, um, usually what you see is there's more demand um, and then the open data community that encourages NGOs to release more data and encourages governments to put more data out there. And again, the people who are communicating that data, whether it be journalists or NGOs, um, their work and their product is more in demand. So, so again, they make more of an effort to, for both the demand um, and supply side. So they try to provide more data stories for citizens and they um, put positive pressure on governments and NGOs to make more data available. So it's the entire cycle that is really accelerating the demand for open data and encouraging technologists to create more tools to facilitate um, that data cycle. How important has open source data become in today's world? It's become, I think, a critical component of encouraging a healthy uh, information ecosystem. Uh, so when I say information ecosystem, I mean that citizens are actively seeking out data um, and better information to make de better decisions to improve their lives. So they're looking for market prices um, to sell their agricultural products on the market that day. Um, and in the middle, journalists and NGOs are looking for more and better data to tell stories um, to inform those citizens. So they're looking for data about hospital locations and school quality and basically more and better data that can inform the news stories that otherwise um, might not go into depth about how citizens should actually act on that information. And as citizens demand more and better information and journalists and NGOs look for sources of data information, um, that has also inspired NGOs and governments um, and academics to provide more and better data, um, more timely data, more in-depth data, whereas before maybe there, that demand would not have existed and nobody would have ever read those reports or looked for those information. But now with an engaged information ecosystem, um, the demand side is there, citizens want better information, um, they realize they're part of globalization and they need to make better under decisions to understand their world and make sure their children and their families are healthy um, and taking advantage of the opportunities that are, that are out there. Um, so the benefit of this is that um, with more and better data, technologists are creating open source tools to make that data more accessible, um, to make visualizations possible, um, to get that information out there at a very low cost to citizens, um, to data infomediaries such as NGOs and journalists that are conveying that information and also to governments and universities that are building databases on open source software um, to make that information easy to update, easy to download, easy to analyze and visualize. Um, so I think open source is really p playing a key role um, in this process of making everybody more informed um, about global issues and more engaged in making better decisions.
Thank you for being a part of our show, Ms. Uh, Eva Constantaris. Uh, today we had Ms. Eva Constantaris, a data journalist for Internews. You're watching PNN. My name is Trisha Bakir.